Good evening. It is time for us to begin. Glad everybody's here. Just a few announcements before Claude leads in song and David Gustin has our devotional thought. A uh, reminder, a few things coming up. Uh, this Saturday, uh, gentlemen, at the Bible chair at 8 a.m. is Dudes and Donuts. Uh, come over and enjoy some time of fellowship. Ladies, at 8.30 over at Gail's house, uh, there's a ladies' Bible study. Bring your favorite breakfast item and have time together with that. So those are coming up. Next Wednesday at 5.30 is our Brown Bag Fellowship. So grab you some food, get up here about 5.30 or so, and uh, spend some time fellowshipping and all that. Um, am I forgetting anything? Sunday's on Sunday, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, correct? Lisa doesn't know. Okay. <laughs> the 28th. Okay. So that's a week and a half away, so be thinking about all that. A uh, reminder for teens and all, we still are meeting in the fellowship hall. I've had a few questions, but yes, we are still continuing our dating and marriage series in the fellowship hall tonight. So with that, go ahead. Four nineteen, four one nine. Lord, we come before Thee now, at Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain, shall we
This evening scripture will be coming from the book of Mark. I'll be reading from chapter 12, verse 31. It's Mark, chapter 12, verse 31. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than this. Thank you, Caden. So, you're all probably familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. But I'll uh, give you all a quick rundown of it anyway. So, an expert of the law asked Jesus what he needed to do to gain eternal life. Jesus asked him, you know, what does the law say about it? Which kind of sounds like one of my bosses, you ask him a question, he said, what does your procedure say? Well, I didn't look at those. Uh... Anyway, Jesus asked him what the law said about it, and the man answered in verse 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus told him that this was correct, but the man not wanting to accidentally love somebody he didn't have to, uh, he asked who his neighbor was. Jesus responded with the parable of the Good Samaritan where... A man had been beaten, robbed, and left for dead on the side of the road. A uh, priest wandered by, and he crossed the road to, uh, to avoid the man. Uh, a Levite passed by in a similar manner. But when a Samaritan man came up on him, he stopped, dressed the man's wounds, and put the man on his own donkey, and took him to an inn uh, to take care of him. Uh, and he paid for all the guy's expenses, plus any expenses that might come later. Now, after Jesus relayed this story, Jesus, he asked the legal expert who he thought the neighbor was in the story. And the man's response in verse 37 is, uh, the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm pretty fond of myself. So, and I, I usually treat me pretty well. And so, uh, but what's interesting here is, is with, with this parable tells us that anybody we come across is our neighbor, not just the person that lives next door to us. Um, and this tells us how we should treat each other and what we should do when we see someone in need. Uh, Mandy and I, a couple weeks ago, uh, we witnessed a car wreck on Washington. Uh, we're on our way to get a quick blizzard during her lunch break, and um, we saw the wreck as we were coming over I-40 on Washington. Well, the first safe place to park happened to be the Dairy Queen, and so I pulled in the Dairy Queen lot, and um, even though that's where I was headed, it, it was just the first safe place. Um, Mandy and I both hopped out of the pickup and, and I instructed her to call 911 and then I went to go check on the drivers. Um, here's where stuff kind of started to frustrate me a little bit. There was all four directions of that light were backed up at least a half a dozen cars. And Mandy and I were the only ones that stopped what we were doing to get out and check on them. Um, that everybody else that was stopped at that light just took off just as soon as they could get around it. Now the ones that were kind of impeded, they had to wait just long enough to get around them, but nobody else got out. And as far as we can tell, um, Mandy's the only one that called 911. And that was even maybe two minutes after the wreck. You know, usually if you call, they, they tell you that somebody's already called it in. But no, she had to give them all the info. So nobody had even called 911 when they're sitting. They watched the wreck just like we did. Um, but it's while we were standing there, I was mad that nobody else stopped. Nobody else got out and helped. And um, I do want to say if, if you know how Gus and men feel about ice cream, Parking at the Dairy Queen and walking the other way was hard. <laughs> uh, Doug, Doug, you know what I'm... You, you're with me, right? 
<laughs> and so um, it's, and as I got to the vehicles, you know, both, both of the drivers were fine, but one of the women was pregnant and obviously was, was going to need attention, but everybody else just drove on by. They didn't feel like it was their job. Of course, now, once the fire department showed up, uh, we got out of the way, and it's not important that there was ice cream involved in us getting out of the way. Uh, about 10 minutes later, we finished our ice cream, and we saw that, you know, the police department was there kind of figuring stuff out, and, and it was kind of starting to get cleaned up a little bit. So before we left, we stopped and checked in with the, one of the officers on the scene, and as we walked up to him, he asked, he said, are y'all the witnesses? I said, yes. Yeah. said, oh, thank goodness. Said, Their stories don't match and nobody else stayed. We don't have a clue what's going on. He said, I know what it looks like, but nobody's given me anything straight. And, and he was, I mean, he was just um, elated that somebody stuck around um, out of the you know, dozen or so people that were right up closest to it. Um, so I didn't tell this story to tell you about my fascination with ice cream or to toot my own horn for checking on these ladies. That's not really what it's about. It, it's, it's really, um, about what made me mad. What, well, not really mad, but it upset me. It frustrated me that no one else stopped. Um, how all these people acted is called, there's a phenomenon known as the bystander effect. Everybody assumes that somebody else is going to take care of it, somebody else is going to help. And now I told Joe that I was going to channel my inner Joe for this and have a call to action like he does with all of his lessons. As Christians, we're not bystanders. Um, we have to be active in helping those that we see in need. This applies to all sorts of things, not just wrecks and flat tires uh, and just things of that nature. But if you see somebody struggling, reach your hand out, talk to them, ask them if you can help them, see what you can do, because the Lord has commanded us to take care of those around us that have a need. Um, on a small side note, and not to dilute my point at all, I'm taking just a little detour here. Um, I want to thank the men and boys of Bell Avenue <clears throat> for stepping up and helping in the absence of a full-time minister, even as we're, we're just at the beginning of all of this. And it's not just with those that have volunteered to help with the preaching and teaching, uh, but with all of the duties that are required to uh, make worship and classes happen. Um, it's... You know, when I'm, when I'm calling or walking around asking for help, I really like that we've got men that are willing to not be bystanders, that are willing to step up and help. Um, and some of you have seen them, others have not, but I've got lists that I carry with me. You know, I've got our weekly men to serve list. There's... Our, one of our teacher lists, there's the other teacher list, and now I've got a list of fill-in preachers. So you can see how many people it takes to make this thing run. Um, and so, um, I, I, like I said, I, I really want to thank the men and boys of Bell Avenue for that, but also um, the wives of, of the men that are helping. Because um, if, if your wives are anything like mine, their major part in helping me develop anything that I stand in front of y'all and say. And I bounce ideas off of her constantly. So the wives that are supporting these men also. Um, we're in the beginning stages of what could be a long process. So as we go along, um, I hope that you guys continue to talk to me and take my calls because <laughs> I am fully aware of what I'm asking from you guys. And so, you know, I have this message telling us that we need to be good about helping, but I also want to thank the guys and everybody that already is and just say that we, we need to continue helping each other. That's the only way that all of this works. 
Um, and if anybody has a need, please come forward as we stand and sing. day on the earth, Lord. I just ask that you um, watch over anybody that's needing um, help right now, Lord, and um, that if uh, anybody needs to turn to you, Lord, that they have the strength and ability to, Lord. Um, I ask that you watch over us as we go to our classes and go home today, Lord. I pray this in your um, son's amazing name, Jesus' name, amen. Lapel. Test one. Okay.
Well, it's good to see everybody out tonight. This is technically class number four, but because of the way scheduling worked and I've had a major change in my work schedule, I'll be able to be back next Wednesday night to continue in my series because Gene's been filling in and this way he has one less preparation and I have enough material for both. So you get me two weeks in a row now. We are, I don't know why that's out of order like that. I thought I had everything put together for this class <laughs> and I do, I just need to find where I need to be to start. I marked this buckle, that's where we stop is with Masada and I made myself a note of that. So let me scroll back here to our map and then we can get going. All right. Don't know why we have that overlay screen of air server on there, but we do. We're looking at the various towns in the southern half of Israel, later known in the divided kingdoms as Judea. And just as a, a brief reminder, it's been two weeks, so get your landmarks. When you want to find Jerusalem, always find the Dead Sea. It's the largest body of water in the land, it's easy to find. Get to the, go to the very top of it and go to your left just a little bit, and that's where Jerusalem is. Have you spotted Jerusalem? Okay. Now, you remember in the biblical scriptures, it talked about from Dan to Beersheba. Where's Beersheba? It's the very bottom right above the word Endemia. It's kind of cut off with a little air server line there. It's right above that. That's Beersheba. Now, on this particular map, it doesn't show Dan. But Dan's at the very north end of all of Israel. So when it talked about from one, from one to the other, be, in our vernacular, we say from A to Z. But in this case, it's from the top of the land to the bottom of the land. Now, on the coast, on your left, you have Gaza. Now, that's in the news today. If anybody's been sleeping under a rock lately, you've missed that. But that's where all the turmoil is, is from Gaza up to about Ashkelon, and then down to Egypt's border. This is an area that is five miles wide from Bell Street here to just about Washington, okay? And then go to Happy, about 25 miles. That's the area of the Gaza Strip. And in that are two and a half million people. It's putting the entire, almost the entire city of Houston in that space, very densely populated. Then going up your coast, we have the towns we talked about last time. We have the Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and um, Jamaria. Then Lydia, Lydia, Emmaus coming off to the right. And we had gotten down to, which one was the first slide did it show? What was the name of that town? Was it Masada? Okay. Then we can do this. Masada's where the arrow is. Masada is at the very bottom, almost at the very bottom of the Dead Sea. It's inland of the sea. It's toward the Mediterranean Sea a little ways. And it is a famous place that's really not in your Bible specifically much. It's in historical history. And we'll cover a little bit of that in a minute. But I think you want to see this. This is Masada. Herod the Great built this as one of his summer palaces. It's multi-tiered. It has running water, even though it's on top of a mesa. They figured out ways to get water up there. It had an indoor pool. And it's, like I said, it's multi-level. This is a little closer view of it. I'm going to walk back to the back and get my little mouse thing so I can be a pointer. But some of this you can tell is modern. That, those wrought iron gates were not there in the, those days. That's put there by locals to keep tourists from falling off the cliff as they go to tour it. But this is where they put in those gates in for safety. And what you have basically here is this part up here on the left is storage. 
When the Romans finally overran these 700 people on the top, they found the storage grains completely full of food. They, didn't, they weren't starving. They didn't give up because they were destitute and about to die anyway. They gave up because they would rather take their own lives and be subjects of the Roman Empire. But this is the top of it. And then this is a side view. Can you see at the very top, that's the Mediterranean Sea. Can you get some appreciation for the height as you look down at that and how far the plane is below the ground level? They didn't have elevators or tramways. If you wanted to get to the top of this, you climbed. The king climbed. Everybody climbed. Now, this part right here, see that fill? That wasn't there before the Romans came to t capture it. That was just a straight down cliff, not quite as far on that side as it is on the opposite side, but that is a man-made, literally, I'm talking of men, buckets, maybe some animals involved. Men were conscripted to gather all this material and pile it up so the Roman Empire could walk, the Roman legions could walk up here to the top on top of that. Imagine how long that took. That is a big area of fill. Masada itself is about 43 miles southeast of Jerusalem. It's not specifically named in the Bible, but it may be where David hid from Saul as recorded in 1 Samuel 24 and in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. This was Herod the Great's winter quarters it was built between 37 and 31 before Christ, but, and now the E is added on all dating. Remember I told you that a few weeks ago, before the Common Era is what BCE stands for. It's the site of the Jewish zealots' last stand between 66 and 73 in their revolt against the Romans. The 960 people on top drew lots they found some are more skilled at killing than others, according to Josephus' writings. And they drew lots as to who would kill who, and then husbands would go home and, and kill their own families, and they would, among the ten of them, until they got down to finding one, and he commits suicide. I just can't imagine going home to kill your wife and children. But 960 people made that choice. That's recorded by Josephus in his book called The Jewish War. So now we go to Edomia, which means red or it means Edom. Edomia is at the very bottom of the map that we were looked at first, and this is an expanded map to show you how far down it does go. The map we had at the very beginning ended about where the top of that red is but Edom itself is the red area that's in that, in that shading. It's all desert. It is all just rugged and rocks and not much else. And again, another shading to show you that it starts kind of at the bottom of the Dead Sea and then goes on down and spreads across. This begins about 60 miles south of Jerusalem the name Edom was given to the firstborn son of Isaac, and his twin brother then was Jacob, as you recall. Edomia was, was named given by the Greeks to the land of Edom, the Edomites. It goes from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea, and it's controlled by the descendants of Esau, which was Jacob's brother, and they, like I mentioned a moment ago, the Edomites. That's recorded in Genesis 25 and also in chapter 36. And throughout their history, they were going to have troubled problems with Israel. My link to my map is not functioning tonight, so. The Edomite land was destroyed to fulfill prophecy that was in Malachi chapter 1, verses, first four, the first four verses. So we'll just move on to the, to these, the Herodium. Herodium then is on the west bank 
It's just below Bethlehem. And how far was Bethlehem from Jerusalem? About eight miles. I'm trying to get these miles into your mind. If we keep repeating them, after a while, I'll start having some repetition. Herodian is another structure that Herod the Great built. And he took a mountain and put a, put a fortress on top. Look at that thing. It's a strange device, but the living quarters were built up here on the very top. And he had a fortress up here. You know what this is right here? It's an amphitheater carved into the side of the mountain, an amphitheater. And then this part right here is a causeway that you walk straight up into and up stairs to the very, very top. This is a massive uh, mountain, if you will, and they just went and carved it up and made living stuff in it. This is a different view of it. It kind of shows the amphitheater a little better because it's a lower angle. That ruin is there. You, if you were to go there, you could go see this today. You can take a tour of this. That's one of the things I was hoping to get to see if I had gotten to go, but on October the 6th, the world changed. And no, I'm not going over there when they're shooting at each other. This is a view from the opposite side. This is not the side of that causeway, but this gives you a little view down into the living area. Now, look, things are deceiving because this is an aerial shot and you can't get a sense of scale. It's like flying in an airplane and you fly over a city and you think it looks like this. You get on the ground and start driving around like, oh, that building's a lot taller than I thought it was from the air. So this is actually taken in the area and I'm glad there's some people in the picture because they give you a little bit of scale. Look how small people look. And this is all, you had to get up there on top and quarry out those rocks from somewhere to make all of those rooms, because this at one time had roofs and all that. This is just the ruins thereof. This was all living area at one time. This is more of it, and it's just massive. This is that amphitheater down at the, on the ground. You can see how it's constructed out of the hillside. They terraced it and then laid it with stone to make seating. So don't complain about your padded pews because they, <laughs> they sat on rock. I guess you could carry a tunic or something, roll it up and sit on it. I don't know. But So the Herodium is eight miles south of Jerusalem. It's, it's the fortress that Herod built from 22 to 15. It took him seven years. It's three miles southeast of Bethlehem and eight miles south of Jerusalem. It's not specifically mentioned in your Bible, but it's one of the most impressive things that Herod built. He built five major structures in addition to restoring the temple and the temple grounds and enlarging them in Jerusalem. Allegedly, Herod the Great is buried here. His tomb has not been found that I know of, but according to Josephus, they buried Herod at this structure. Moving to Bethlehem, oh, little town of Bethlehem, you know, that little song goes. Bethlehem, as you should know now, is about eight miles south of Jerusalem. And this is what it looks like at night, very picturesque. You want to guess what that is? You should know. You've seen that probably 500 times around Easter. It's the Church of the Nativity. This is allegedly where Jesus was born. They built a church or a mosque on top of every single place that you can think of just about in the Bible. Whether that's the actual site, you don't really know. But this is the church of the nativity. You're probably more familiar with seeing this scene, which is at the very bottom of, in the basement area of that building. That hole is supposedly over the exact spot that Jesus was born. And I'm going to say wink, wink, because I highly doubt that's the exact spot that Jesus was born. Because that church wasn't even there. What does the scripture say? Where was he born? There was no room at the inn, so where did he where was he born? He was born in a stable. Now I happened to grow up with a pole barn for a milk cow, and it had my dad had fashioned a half of a 55-gallon drum type thing and metal straps to attach it, and that was the feed trough for the cow to sit in there and eat while you milked her. 
in my mind's eye, Jesus was born and put in the feed trough. It was off the ground, probably. That's just my supposition. You're free to have your interpretation because the Bible doesn't tell you. So Bethlehem is about six miles. It's, but here's other things that Bethlehem is known for. It's the burial place of Rachel in Genesis 35. It's the home of Boaz and Ruth from the book of Ruth. Tradition says that Samson, one of the judges, was born here. That's Judges 13, 2 through 25. But it's tradition. You won't find that exactly word for word in the scripture. It's the birthplace of David and the site of his anointing in 1 Samuel. It's the birthplace of Jesus, which you would know, but it's prophesied in Micah. And, of course, his birth. It's the home to Mary and Joseph in Luke. And that's the end of the data that we have on Bethlehem. So it takes us to Bethany. Bethany is to the just a little to the north and a little to the east of Jerusalem. So what Bethany looks like today, they didn't have those kind of modern buildings then, but you see it's a sleepy little village looking here, right? Well, not exactly. This is one view at the last edge of the city that makes you think it looks like this everywhere, right? Well, turn around and it looks like this. So you're, it's hard to visualize what did it look like because it probably looked more like the first picture than it looks like this one. This is hundreds of thousands of years of buildings after the fact. Well, Bethany's two miles east. What happened here? Well, this is the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is where Lazarus is raised from the dead in John chapter 11. It's where Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. It's the city from which Jesus goes to enter the Jerusalem of what's now called Palm Sunday by modernists. It was, this was to fulfill prophecy, though, that he would enter Jerusalem. It's written back in Zechariah chapter 9. Christian tradition says Bethany is where the Lord blessed his disciples just prior to his ascension. Again, I've put in the word tradition because it doesn't say that in the text. So I want to make that clarification. But the actual account of it is recorded in Luke and in Acts. And some scholars suggest that Bethany could be where Jesus healed the blind beggar Bartimaeus on his return from Jericho to Jerusalem, as mentioned in Mark 10 and in Luke chapter 18. Again, that's not a certainty, because when you get to the account, it says he encounters this man and doesn't tell you where. Takes us to Ephraim. There are no photos of Ephraim. You know why there's no photos of Ephraim? Because we don't know where it was. Not exactly. They'll put it on a map, and they, we think, like you have here, and there it is on the map, but they're not certain that's exactly where it was. It's lost to history. But what happened there, biblically? Well, it's 12 to 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. The site's still not certain. Jesus goes to Ephraim with his disciples before the Passover in John chapter 11. And this is the only biblical reference to this town, is John eleven fifty four. However, it's believed to be located in the hill country of Judah. It's not to be confused with the tribe of Ephraim, which was in the northern kingdom of Israel. It's possibly within the territory that was given to the tribe of Ephraim in the promised land as recorded in Joshua chapter 16, verse 5. And again, some scholars speculate that the city of Ephraim might refer to Ophrah, which is in the ter tribal territory of Benjamin. When you have a lost city, you can make any supposition you want because you can't prove or disprove. But this is their best guess, and I'm giving it to you as a best guess because it's not known as a fact. We know the city existed because it's in John chapter 11, 54. We just don't know exactly where that was. And Ophrah is mentioned in the Old Testament as the home of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. So we'll go to Jericho next. 
Where's Jericho? Jericho is in the bottom of the Rift Valley just across the Jordan River. This is the very first city that the Israelites come to when they've come out of Egypt. They crossed the river. Does anybody recall, was the river at normal size or was it skinny or was it at flood stage when they got there? It was at flood stage. Somewhere in my 10 million pictures on my hard drive is a picture of the Jordan River at flood stage. And it's about half a mile wide at that point. Now, I don't know how deep it is, but it's way out of its banks. And wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall kind of amongst the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant because the command was for them to step into the water and it was going to recede. And can you imagine, uh, we'll make George and Bill our two mythical priests here, and, and Bill says to George, <clears throat> I was in front yesterday. It's your turn to be in front. <laughs> I'm going to get on the back of the pole today. Because yeah, what's going to happen when you step into a river at flood stage? You could just... And you're gone. Well, not only did the waters part, but they backed up almost 15 miles. Where's the water coming from? It's coming from the Sea of Galilee, from the top. And it names a town, which I don't, don't have committed to my memory, of how far back the water backed up. And you can find that town on a map. That's how you know how far it was. But it didn't just part the width of this auditorium. Everybody runs across. It backed up from here to Canyon. And two million people walked across on wet ground? No. Dry ground. This is an artist's drawing of what they think from the digs. A lot, of, a lot of stuff is there. From the outlines of the dirt and stuff, this is what artists think it looked like at the time that the Israelites arrived. Again, it's an artist's conception, but it's based on some fact. Here's what's actually there now. That is current, modern, today, well, very recent, of Jericho. There's not much of the walls actually showing. It's filled in with a lot of blow dirt and stuff like that. They're deep digging into it, and then the government says you've got to stop for a while. And there's a whole lot of going on with that. But this may give you a better view of a dig that goes down and shows some of the depth of the walls when they dug down inside. This is another view of some of the rock type of wall. Some of this has been reconstructed. In other words, they cleared away the earth part, the overblown dirt. See that at the top? That's just blow dirt, we would call it. And then the rock wall begins there, but I think that's been reconstructed because what does the Bible say happened to the wall? They fell, and they fell outward, didn't they? So part of that has been reconstructed by archaeologist. Another view showing the depth. That's some 12, 15 feet down that they've dug. Because what happens to civilizations in that time? If something's overrun and is made rubble, what happens then when they want to rebuild? They just build right on top of where they were. And that's why these digs will go down, oh, this is a piece of pottery from this era. And, oh, this is a coin from that era. And this is a, that's how they do that. But that's how that's, how that's reconstructed. Here's some more that's been cleared away and, and clearly re-preserved or put back together, if you will. Now, this gives a cross-section of the land between Jerusalem and Jericho. If you start on the far left at the top, that's Jerusalem. And immediately next to it is called the Kidron Valley. That's one of the reasons Jerusalem was very difficult to attack, because it's a horseshoe valley on three of the four sides. It's deep and very steep coming back up. And they didn't have modern warfare with rockets and tanks and that sort of thing. You had to go up there with your sword, your spear, and your arrow and try to take a city. And so it's quite easy to defend. If somebody's down 100 feet below you, you just drop a rock on them. 
and there's no shortage of rocks in Jerusalem, in that whole area. So it goes down, but then it goes back up to the Mount of Olives. Do you see that? The Mount of Olives is that little peak right there. So when they went to the Mount of Olives, you had to go down the hill and back up into the city. When they arrested Jesus, they went down the Kidron Valley, went up to the Mount of Olives and got him and took him back into Jerusalem. But to go on, you come down to this place and there's a little flat spot they call the shoulder because it just levels off. And then it goes what's now known as the Roman road ascent or descent in this case, because we're going that direction. And you go way, way downhill to the very bottom in a canyon. And then you come up to where there's an old ruins of a Roman fort and there's a Turkish inn on this little lump. And then you continue downhill again to the ascent. I don't know how to say that word, it's Arabic. And you wind up in Jericho. So I want you to see that topography because from up at the top down to the bottom, you're going down 1,700 feet. That's a 170 story building if you want to get that in your mind. Well, this is what the road looks like. It's interesting that David's class uh, mentioned the Good Samaritan and the road to Jericho. This was a treacherous place. You see any vegetation? There's not a tree. There's not a blade of grass. There's nothing. Now, in the very bottom of this is a wadi. Anybody know what a wadi is? Wadi is a creek. And you look on maps and you see wadi this or wadi that, it means a creek, a water flow of water. We would call it a river or a creek. They call them wadis. This is the actual road. How far did the priest and the, uh, I'm trying to blank. Thank you. The Levite have to walk to get around the guy laying in the road. They almost had to step over him. He was not on the highway like we have I-40 and he's on one side and you walk over the other side to get around him. That road isn't much wider than this aisle. And so here's a guy laying left for dead and I'm just gonna go around him. But you were really close, weren't you? You couldn't sort of like, I didn't see you. But that's the actual road, and you can walk it. Uh, it's permitted if you want to get your water containers and all that stuff and have the right gear. You can walk that if you choose to, and many tourists do. Jericho itself is 17 miles east. It's the home of Rahab the harlot, as Joshua 2 records. You know, she hid the spies and helped them to escape. <clears throat> And then the city walls were shouted down by Israel in the sixth chapter of Joshua. And in the sixth chapter, a curse is put on Jericho. I don't know if you remember that. It doesn't get talked about much. It doesn't mention much. There was a curse on anyone who would rebuild the city, and that came to pass. It's in Scripture. It was fulfilled in 1 Kings chapter 16. The sons of Hiel, if I said his name right, the loss of his firstborn was with the start of the foundation he went to rebuild the city. That son's name was A-B-I-R-A-M. Abram, if I didn't mispronounce that. Abraham, however you want to say it. His first son died with the start, and his youngest son died when he set up its gates, and that son's name was Segub. That's in 1 Kings 16.35. It's the location of a school of the prophets mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 15. Elijah purified the water there by casting salt into its spring in 2 Kings chapter 2. It's the city from which Elijah departs into heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2, first five verses. It's where Jesus Remember, had him in one place, now we got him over here. We don't know which end of the road he was on, but here's another thought that Jesus healed a blind man, man named Bartimaeus, and that's recorded in Mark and Luke, but it doesn't tell you which city. It's where Jesus meets Zacchaeus. Is in Jericho. 
And the road between them is where the illustration of the Good Samaritan is, I already mentioned. And that's the end of the data we have in Jericho. Jericho has another name. Do you know what it's called? City of Palms. Many, many, many palm trees are there. And it's thought by some geologists to be one of the oldest cities in the world. Qumran. Qumran is an area at the north end of the Dead Sea. And you talk about rugged area. All this has been rugged. This is more of it. These are the caves in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They're numbered. Caves 1, 2, 3, and 11 are north, about a mile. It tells you that up here at the top. Then we have caves 4A and 4B and cave 5 and cave 6 and cave 10 and cave 7, 8, and 9 all listed on this one picture. And you can see the holes there. We're going to get a close-up of that in a second. It's amazing that all this was hidden in this one little spot. And then a mile away is another set of caves where they found a few more fragments. That gives you a closer view. You can see a stratified lamp, looks like stratified limestone. And then inside, you can see sunlight coming in from somewhere in the edge. And somebody climbed up in there and found these earthen, earthen pots with scrolls rolled up inside of them. Now, why would they be so well preserved there? Number one, there was no ultraviolet light in that cave. Secondly, they were inside an earthen vessel. Third, We'll have it in another slide somewhere else, but I can mention it here, you can just reinforce it later. Annual rainfall here is two inches a year. Two. So they didn't get wet. And they didn't mildew. Relative humidity is like zero. <laughs> and this is some of the buildings around the Qumran caves that are not right up against them. Um, do yourself a favor sometime and just get on YouTube and, and type Qumran Caves and Dead Sea Scrolls. And boy, they'll take you there and they'll get up close and they'll stick cameras in the cave and you can do the whole bit as if you were there. Without having to be in 110 degree weather and no humidity. So this is 25 miles east of Jerusalem and Qumran himself is not listed in the Bible as such. It's an area. It's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and this is how recent they are. Sometimes you think they've been forever. They were found a year after I was born. I know, I'm older than dirt, but still. 1947 to 1956 is when these were found. That's fairly recent in world history. 70 years now, but still, compared to world history, it's very short. This is where copies of biblical texts were found, and also some non-biblical texts. There wasn't all Bibles that was in those jars. But they found fragments of almost every book of the Hebrew Old Testament. Archaeology suggests that Qumran was inhabited by a Jewish community during the Second Temple period. This may have been the Essenes. I say may have been, it may not have been, but it may have been the Essenes. And here's where I was talking about. It's one of the most arid places in the Middle East with less than two inches of annual rainfall. Well, now we come to Bethany beyond the Jordan. We've already had one Bethany. This is the second Bethany, and it's literally called Bethany beyond the Jordan, which means it's going to be on the east side of the Jordan. The other Bethany is on the west side of the Jordan, very close to Jerusalem. This one is quite a ways away because Jericho is 17 miles, and this is on the other side of the river from there. But what's unique about that, it is pretty barren. There's not, not much left in the way of any kind of a ruin on that side of the river at the moment. This land at the moment is in the area of Jordan. Jordan has the title to this land now. And they did make a marker and a memorial thing here at this town because you have this there. What do you think that is? You don't have to guess. I just want you to think about 
what's the deal? Because Bible's going to say the words that kind of intrigues me. When I say much, do you think of little or do you think of quite a bit of something? It'll become important in a second. Bethany beyond the Jordan is 31 miles east of Jerusalem. Tradition has it that Jesus was baptized in Bethany beyond the Jordan, and that's recorded in all four of the gospel records. It says the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. The voice of God was heard affirming Jesus as his son, and John the Baptist testifies to the crowds about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John chapter 1. In the return to Bethany beyond the Jordan, in John chapter 10, Jesus returns to the area around the Jordan River where John had been baptizing, perhaps here. Now, it says in that text that he was there because there was much water. That doesn't look like much water <laughs> to my mind's thought. But compared to the desolation of the whole area, that's more than a puddle, and it is deep enough, and people do go there on these tours, tours of the Holy Land, and people will be baptized in there all day long. To say I was baptized in the same water where Jesus was baptized. And not the same, actually, you know, the rest is evaporated long ago, but the same place. Okay, well, there's our bell, so we'll have to stop there. We'll pick up next week with another one uh, of uh, Herod the Great's fortresses, Macherius. It's another very, very impressive thing he built. All right, we'll have a prayer and we'll dismiss for the evening. Father, thank you for allowing us to have pictures of things that we read about in the Bible that we can kind of see what it might have looked like. It might have been. It, it, we still don't understand that society and how you would live without running water or without uh, the modern conveniences of heating and air conditioning that we enjoy and modes of transportation where the, everything was so rugged and you either walked or rode a mule or did something and it gives us an, a new appreciation and perhaps the, seeing the scene of the story Jesus told about the Good Samaritan kind of helped us understand how rugged and how treacherous that area was and how small the road was of those who were willing to help uh, the Samaritan was willing to help even when two people who should have known better didn't. Uh, we're, we're mindful that the, the book you left for us is more than just a series of short stories. It's a living testament to people's lives and the way they lived. And we can study them and see what they did and how the perils they lived in, the times in which they lived, and the, the struggles against the elements. And yet, they would go through periods of time when they would turn to you and then they would turn away from you and follow false gods and help us as a society that we not do the same thing. Be with us as we separate and give us safety where we go. We pray for those that are sick and help us in our search for a new minister. Bless the men who are working in that effort. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll tell you one more thing. One of my coworkers at work told me a kind of a semi-funny today. And he said, <clears throat> you know, if the Apostle Paul was living today, you think we might get a letter? And I thought, uh, yeah, we probably do one. All right, have a nice evening.